Um, so it's the fundamentals of energy statistics or introduction to energy statistics. So let me just open my presentation. So please bear with me. Okay. So before moving on to before moving on to the full um, fuel specific presentations, we thought it would be helpful to first provide an overview on some of the fundamental concepts in energy statistics. So energy data can be used for a variety of different purposes, such as tracking and understanding energy supply and demand trends, generating energy balances and indicators, and reviewing energy security, understanding energy access, and informing and evaluating policy design. The products that we use and the issues that we encounter are common across all countries. So to aid understanding and comparability, it is important that we use common terms, definitions, and methodologies in data collection and dissemination. At the IEA, our point of reference are the International Recommendations for Energy Statistics, or IRIS. IRIS is an internationally agreed upon set of recommendations adopted by the UN Statistical Commission in 2011, which aims to ensure cross-country comparability of data by providing common standards and guidance to energy statisticians on concepts, definitions, and methodologies. IRIS has been translated into the six official languages of the United Nations and is, is available to download from the UN website. So we would encourage you to download and refer to IRIS in your work. And uh, the link, in case you need it, the link is available uh, on the screen here. And you have access to this uh, presentation afterwards. So moving on, uh, we will look now look at some of the key concepts referred to in IRIS. So firstly, there is the scope and boundaries of energy statistics. So from basic physics, we know that the universe is made up of energy and matter, and there are various forms of energy, light, heat, chemical, kinetic, etc. Energy is observed all around us. However, not all energy is included within energy statistics. Generally speaking, energy which does not have a direct impact on society is not measured or monitored as part of energy statistics. Therefore, we need to draw a boundary around what we consider to be inside and outside of energy statistics. And IRIS helps us to draw, draw this boundary by providing concepts, uh, common concepts and definitions. And these include some of the items shown here on screen. So firstly, there is energy products, which are the forms of energy suitable for direct use, such as coal, oil, gas, and electricity. And we have energy flows, which are the activities involving the production, trade, transformation, and final use of energy across the consuming sectors. These flows are defined based on the international standard industrial classifications of all economic activities, otherwise known as ISIC, so ISIC codes. Then we have the concept of production. So this is a, an extremely important concept and marks the starting point at which energy enters energy statistics. Here, IRIS provides definitions and conventions, which will be touched upon in later presentations regarding the boundaries of production, the form of energy produced, whether primary or secondary, the producer type, whether main activity producer or auto producer. And um, these all have, these conventions have implications for where production appears in the energy balance. So to give you an example, in energy statistics, we only consider production to be marketable production. So for instance, coal production would not refer to the initial amount of material drawn out of the ground, which might include rocks and gravel, but the marketable production made available after washing the coal to remove, to remove these impurities. Similarly, fuel wood production only includes wood used for energy purposes, not all of the wood cut down to make furniture um, and used in construction and other activities. In addition, 
There are conventions around how to calculate the primary production value for renewable sources, such as hydro and wind. And again, these will be touched upon in later presentations. Another useful concept is the idea of the energy sector. And this is the economic sector whose primary activity is the production, transformation, and distribution of energy. And this sector is considered separately from other industrial sectors in energy statistics. And finally, there is the concept of the reference territory. In energy statistics, data refer to all energy activities physically taking place within the national territory of the country, regardless of the nationality or the domicile of the players. Um, so this differs from the residence principle, which is used in other statistical systems, which looks at the domicile of the players, not their geographical location. So now um, we'll move on to uh, our first Menti. And as mentioned, you can access Menti using the app if you have it on your phone um, or on the website using the code provided. So I saw a couple of uh, participants have joined us since, the, since this presentation began. So to join Menti, um, it's an interactive uh, website where you can answer questions. Just go to www.menti.com and enter the code provided. So now I will take you over to Menti. Okay, so the question is, uh, which are included in the energy balance of a country? So natural gas for heating, all solar energy reaching that country, fugitive methane emissions from coal mining, fuel wood used for cooking, electricity used by citizens overseas, or natural gas used as ammonia feedstock. So um, there can be more than one answer. So what do you think is included in the energy balance of a country? Okay, so we see some uh, some answers coming in. So we have uh, two front runners: natural gas used for heating and fuel wood used for cooking. Uh, and then, so so far we have answers in all of the five categories, um, but a couple of front runners. So I'll just give, uh, wait a minute to let some more answers come in and then I will give you the answers. Okay, so we have 36 answers for natural gas used for heating. So far out of 106 participants, so um, I think I can give you the answers now. So there were three correct answers. The first one, natural gas used for heating. Yes, this is this is obviously correct. It's um, something we, we do uh, in, in our homes. It's, uh, it's an energy use of natural gas, so that one makes sense. Then um, all solar energy reaching that country. So we do include solar energy in the energy balance. But as I mentioned earlier, we only use, um, we, only, we, consider, we only consider energy that is used directly um, by society or that impacts society in energy statistics. Here, all of the solar energy reaching that country, for, for instance, the sunshine falling outside today on our gardens, and on our streets, that sort of energy would be excluded. We would only include solar energy where it is used, for instance, to create electricity uh, or heat. So we only use this. We only include solar energy where it is used, not all solar energy. Um, similarly, for fugitive methane emissions from coal mining, uh, when you mine coal, when you dig it out of the ground, some natural gas methane can escape. Um, this information can be useful but it is not included, it's not considered production and it's not included within the energy balance. However, the data may be collected as part of uh, our energy statistics system, but they would not be included in the balance itself. 
Then fuel wood used for cooking. Again, this is an energy purpose of fuel wood. So yes, it is included. If it was wood used for construction or to build furniture um, for non-energy purpose, it would not be included. So fuel wood is. Then electricity used by citizens overseas. So if we look at a national energy balance, um, for instance, we're here in France today. Um, so if I, living in France, was to go overseas, my electricity consumption, for instance, in Germany, would not be included in the French energy balance, but it would be included in the German energy balance. So the data are included in a balance somewhere, but for a national energy balance, it only looks at the national territory of the country. It does not look at the activities of citizens or companies overseas outside of the national territorial boundaries. Uh, and finally, natural gas used, used as ammonia feedstock. So here we're using a fossil fuel, natural gas. We're using it for a non-energy purpose. It's being used to create ammonia, for instance, in the fertilizer industry. This, even though it is a non-energy use, it is included in uh, the energy balance as all production of natural gas would be included in the supply section. So for, in order for the balance to balance, uh, you would include the non-energy uses. Okay, so moving back to the presentation. So we can move on to the next important topic, which is the energy balance. Now there will be a specific module on energy balances on day four. Therefore, I will just touch on the, on the concept of energy balances now, and we'll go more into this more detail on day four. So firstly, what is an energy balance? Well, to quote Iris, an energy balance is an accounting framework for the compilation of data on all energy products entering, exiting, and used within the national territory of a given country during a reference period. At the IEA, we have five main annual questionnaires, coal, oil, natural gas, renewables, and electricity and heat. And these collect annual data on each of the main fuel groups. However, although the questionnaires are interrelated, none alone provides an overview of the entire energy landscape of a country. So what the energy balance does is it compiles and reconciles the data for all fuels and flows into a single table, providing a summary overview of energy supply and demand in a country for a given time period. So for example, here is a version of the IEA energy balance. As you can see, it's a two dimensional matrix composed of products and flows. So we have products across the top uh, in the columns, and then down in the rows, we have flows. So firstly, let's look at the columns, which I, as I mentioned, show the products. So within a single column, uh, we see the commodity balance for an individual fuel, such as crude oil. So here, for crude oil, you can see all of the production, the trade, supply, transformation, and consumption of that specific fuel. Then next, within the rows, we see each flow of energy in the balance um, across all of the fuel, all of the products. So, for instance, we can see uh, all of the energy product exports, or all of the fuels entering and leaving an oil refinery. As the name suggests, an energy balance is in balance. And this means that it, it is internally consistent and that the values in the rows and the columns add up arithmetically and that there's a logic to them. So horizontally in the rows, the last cell is uh, in the total, it's in the total column. This is simply the sum of the values in the other cells in that row. Uh, vertically, the logic is slightly different. There is no total row. Um, and instead, as shown on a later slide, there are different supply, transformation, and demand sections, which are both internally consistent and in balance with each other. So to achieve this balance, the data in the table are presented in a single common energy unit. Uh, in the case of the example shown on screen, this is KTOE, or kilotons of oil equivalent. However, other units such as terajoules are also commonly used. 
And this is critical. The data need to be in a common unit to enable addition and comparison. Otherwise, the balance uh, would be meaningless. For example, adding tons and barrels in gigawatt hours, adding these data in different units together would not make sense. So you need it to be in a single unit. And finally, because uh, all of the data are present and shown in a common unit, we can define total energy supply and consumption figures. Uh, and these can be used to derive some basic high level indicators, such as energy self-sufficiency, total energy supply per population or total energy supply per GDP or gross domestic product. Uh, I should just note here that in order to save space in the table shown, some of the flows and products have been aggregated. For instance, here, individual oil products such as uh, gasoline and diesel have been aggregated into a single oil product uh, column. And likewise, some of the flows have been aggregated, but this was just done to save space. In an extended energy balance, you would see all of the products and flows separately. Um, however, the concept remains the same. So moving on, the products used in our energy reporting are based on the hierarchy and internationally agreed definitions provided in IRIS. More specifically within IRIS, there is an energy product classification system called SIEC, which stands for Standard International Energy Classification. SIEC arranges the energy products in the structure of a statistical classification. So here you can see the structure of the SIEC table in IRIS. And within SEEK, products are categorized into 10 broad product families or sections. For example, coal, oil, biofuels, etc. And these broad sections are then broken down into the individual product classes. For instance, coal is disaggregated into anthracite, subbituminous coal, cooking coal, etc. SIEC also provides correspondences between products and those shown in other classification systems such as CPC and HF. Uh, and as mentioned, IRIS was first adopted in 2011. And since then, the energy landscape has changed somewhat with the emergence of new energy products such as hydrogen and ammonia. As a result, SIEC is currently undergoing a revision and following review an updated version will be released in the next couple of years. So now let's look at the structure of the energy balance. Uh, so the energy balance is broken into two broad blocks, the supply side and the demand side. By convention, the demand side is further disaggregated into two or three broad subsections. So firstly, transformation, which presents flows of energy being transformed into another product. For instance, energy entering and exiting a power plant. Secondly, energy industry own use, which pre presents energy demand for non-transformation purposes within the energy sector. For instance, fuel used to provide light and heat in oil refineries. And lastly, there is final consumption, which presents uh, demand by the non-energy industry sectors, such as uh, industry, residential, and the transport sector. So looking more closely at supply, we can see that it presents just a few broad high level flows. So we have production, trade, international aviation and marine bunkers and stock changes. However, although there's only a few flows present, this is a good starting point for looking at the energy picture of a country, as we can see the relative importance of the different products, the level of self-sufficiency for a given product, and whether the country is a net importer or exporter. And the sum of these flows gives us the total energy supply for a country. So moving on to the next block, below supply, we have the transformation and energy sector demand. As mentioned, transformation refers to the conversion of one form of energy to another, such as coal to electricity. And both inputs and outputs are shown on a single line in the balance. However, they are distinguished by sign. Energy inputs to transformation are shown with a negative sign and energy outputs with a positive sign. As we know, transformation is not 100% efficient. There are energy losses and the transformation losses are the difference between inputs and outputs. As a balance needs to be internally consistent, 
the losses are shown in the total column as a negative value. As the transformation block shows inputs and outputs in a common unit, the data can also be used to run some basic efficiency checks, which are important for data validation. An important concept related to the second block is the distinction between transformation and energy industry own use. For instance, in an oil refinery, crude oil is transformed into secondary oil products such as gasoline. In this case, crude oil is a transformation input, while oil products are the transformation output. However, the refinery also uses energy to support the operations of the refinery itself for lighting and heating, etc. Uh, this fuel use is not considered a transformation input, and it is instead categorized separ separately as energy industry own use. And it's important to note the distinction as in an, in an extended energy balance where flows have not been aggregated, it can seem like, seem like some of the flows are duplicated with two flows for refineries, two flows for blast, blast furnaces, etc. However, in fact, the flows are not duplicated. It's just that one refers to transformation and the other to energy industry owners. Then we have the last block, which is final consumption. And here we see deliveries of energy products to all final consumers outside of the energy industry sector, whether for energy or non-energy purposes. So for example, we have industry, transport, residential and commercial and public services, et cetera. It should be noted that under IRIS methodology, transport is a cross-cutting sector not linked to an industry. So for example, the fuel used for trucks transporting iron ore within the iron and steel industry would be reported under transport, not under iron and steel. And finally, it's important to note that energy balances include demand for fossil fuel derived energy products used for non-energy purposes. For instance, bitumen used for paving roads or natural gas used for fertilizer production. The distinction here between energy and non-energy use of products is important as it affects CO2 emissions calculations. This is because the carbon in fuel combusted for energy purposes releases CO2, whereas the carbon contained in energy products used to create a plastic container, for instance, remains stored in that product for its lifetime. If there was an emission associated with it, with its production, it might be included in um, another sector of the greenhouse gas emissions inventories, such as agriculture, process emissions or waste, but not the energy sector. However, it's important to note that non-energy use generally refers to fossil fuels only. By convention, as I mentioned earlier, energy statistics does not include the production of waste or wood or biomass used for non uh, used for not used for energy purposes so for instance wood used in construction or in the manufacture of furniture is not included in production so likewise it should not be included in energy non-energy demand either. so here we see a summary of the energy balance um, flows oriented from left to right rather than top to bottom on the left, we see supply, and on the right, we see demand. As previously mentioned, an energy balance needs to be in balance. The numbers need to add up. In an ideal world, supply and demand would be in perfect alignment. However, in the real world, this is difficult to achieve due to issues with data availability, uh, difference in sources and coverage, etc. As a result, supply and demand data may differ. And this difference is shown as using a balancing item known as statistical difference. This is an important item and it can highlight issues with data quality. A large statistical difference um, might imply uh, issues with data availability, which should be our data availability or data quality, which should be investigated. Uh, however, care should also be taken when interpreting a zero statistical difference. A zero statistical difference can imply high data quality. How it, however, it can also signify data availability issues um, as some flows in the balance may have been estimating, estimated by setting them equal to the difference between supply and demand, thus creating an artificial zero statistical difference. The sign of the statistical difference can be negative or positive and looking at this can help understand where issues may lie in the balance. Similarly, the stock change value can also be positive or negative, 
depending on whether a stock build or stock draw took place. So the energy balance itself can be visualized using a Sankey diagram with the flows uh, shown as lines and the relative magnitude uh, show, represented by the thickness of the lines. So moving on to uh, some of the conventions with working with energy statistics. So there may be different units of measurement that we may encounter in energy statistics. We can measure units in mass, volume, or energy units. And depending on the country, we might use imperial or metric units. So as energy statisticians, we frequently need to convert from one unit to another, um, be it to compare data in different units to create energy balances, et cetera. Converting within one category of units is generally easy as the conversion factors are constant. For example, one metric ton is always a thousand kilograms. However, to convert between categories, we need additional information uh, such as product specific densities or product specific calorific values. Energy balances are based on energy units. However, some data are commonly collected in physical units such as tons of coal. Therefore, both the accuracy of the calorific values and the underlying energy data are important in ensuring accurate energy balances. So to expand uh, a little further on calorific values, energy balances express information in energy units and to convert from energy units, uh, to convert from physical units to energy units, we need a conversion factor called a calorific value. And this represents the heat energy released when a fuel is combusted. Uh, different fuels can have different calorific values. However, calorific values can also differ within the same product. For instance, bituminous coal in New Zealand has about 50% more energy content than per unit of mass than the equivalent amount in Kazakhstan. Therefore, using uh, a New Zealand calorific value in place of a Kazakh one or vice versa would dramatically affect and distort the efficiencies and energy flows observed in the energy balance. Therefore, it's important to collect information on calorific values uh, at the same time as color collecting the information on physical quantities. So I'm just conscious of time. So um, I will just move on here. And uh, the topic of calorific values will be covered in a following presentation as well. So just to conclude, I have a few final comments on the benefits of collecting energy statistics. So firstly, reliable, accurate, and timely energy data are indispensable for policymakers to enable sound evidence-based decision-making. This can include the development and formulation of energy policies, the monitoring and reaction to energy security developments. And in addition, it can feed into other areas such as energy access, health, uh, emissions, the environment, et cetera. Reliable data are also useful for the business community in terms of analysis, uh, planning, and providing market signals. In addition, they can be used for collaboration and benchmarking and by the general public in terms of raising awareness, uh, aiding the understanding of energy usage, uh, and by researchers and students in academia. So we can also use basic energy data and combine it with other data sets to, such as population and GDP to uh, generate a variety of useful indicators. And shown here are some examples of energy indicators related to the economy shown in IRIS. Um, they can also be used to combine with, as I mentioned, GDP and population. And sometimes creating different indicators can be useful as they can provide a different perspective. For instance, here we can see uh, total energy supply per capita worldwide has been slowly increasing whereas energy supply per unit of GDP has been slowly decreasing um, as there has been decoupling between economic growth and energy usage. Uh, similarly, using energy data, we can apply the greenhouse gas emission factors and methodologies provided by IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, to generate emissions of CO2 and emissions from fuel combustion. And of course, we can move beyond the high level energy data shown in an energy balance and zoom in and look at more disaggregated end use consumption. For instance, breaking residential energy consumption into energy used for lighting, space heating, and cooling. And this can be used to create more advanced 
energy efficiency indicators, which can be useful for tracking the success of specific energy policies. Of course, this requires more detailed data and it re may require changes in data collection templates. Therefore, it's important as energy statisticians that we periodically review data requirements to ensure the continuing relevance of our energy statistics. After all, this is the goal of collecting energy statistics to, provide, to produce and provide relevant and useful information. So this brings me to the conclusion of this first presentation. As I mentioned, we will have some specific presentations on fuels and balances throughout the week. So if some of the concepts or methodologies I have mentioned related to balances were unclear, I'm sure they will become clearer as the week goes on. However, I would be happy now to pause for any questions that you might have.